Sunday of Advent, the first Sunday of the season that leads up to Christmas Day. Uh, Advent is, is the beginning of the Christmas season. And at Christmas we celebrate the incarnation of King Jesus. That special miraculous event when God took on human form in the person of Jesus Christ. And the prophet Isaiah, some 700 years before the birth of Christ, announced this miraculous event. And I want us to read that as we come to worship God this morning. Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the seal of the Lord will do this. Isaiah, as I said, 700 years before the birth of Christ. Look forward and we read these, these words in, in, in Isaiah 9 of the coming of Jesus. And we're going to sing this morning the song, Come Thou Expected Jesus. Let's pray before we do that. Heavenly Father, thank you that we enter into this Christmas season with much joy, with great hope, experiencing much grace. And Lord, thank you that this side of the cross, this side of Isaiah's announcement of the birth of Christ, we have received King Jesus. We have received King Jesus not just to this earth, but into our hearts. And thank you, Lord, this morning that we can say we know him as the wonderful counsellor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Thank you, Lord, that of your increase of your government and peace there will be no end. And thank you this morning for all of us who have put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We now have experienced that peace, peace with God. Father, we pray over this Christmas period, we will also know the, know the peace of God. Well, Lord, would you, would you be pleased with our worship this morning as we come to celebrate you, to worship you this morning? May you be glorified in our worship, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you this morning for that truth. Not just that Christ was born, but Christ was born for us. Thank you, Lord, that we can celebrate this Christmas season with full hearts because we know that Christ was born for us and he has been. His light has risen in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Please take your seats as we gather around the Lord's table this morning. Let's keep in an attitude of worship as we gather around his table. this Christmas time we celebrate the incarnation coming to earth of God in the form of Christ 
But without the incarnation, without Christmas, there will be no cross. There will be no substitutionary death on our behalf for our sins. There will be no redemption. And so because of the incarnation, we're able to come and gather around the Lord's table because when the angels announced this miraculous event to the shepherds some 2,000 years ago, they said, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, a Saviour who is Christ the Lord. God in human flesh was born in a stable. As the angels announced the birth of Christ, they said he was to be our saviour, our saviour from our sin. In the very announcement of Christ's birth, we see his purpose. Some 33 years later, Jesus Christ the Lord hangs on a cruel cross where his father crushes his son for our sin. So that by trusting in Christ, Jesus becomes our substitute for the sins that we've committed. And instead of experiencing God's wrath, we can know the forgiveness of our sins. This table this morning speaks loudly to us of Christ's work on the cross. The bread symbolizing his broken body. The cup symbolizing the shedding of his blood. As we gather around this table this morning, it is both a commemoration of what Christ has done and a celebration of Christ's saving work. 1 Corinthians 11, we read these words. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We break bread this morning and we're going to eat and we're going to drink in remembrance of Christ in remembrance of what he accomplished for us on the cross so let's give thanks Lord we thank you this morning for this table that is spread before us simple it may be but profound in what it speaks of Lord we thank you that you were prepared to have your body broken and your blood shed for us, for all who are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for giving this table as a remembrance of all that you did, all that you accomplished on the cross for us. And we will do it until we meet you in glory or you return. Lord, it's our joy to take part in this very simple meal this morning. Amen. I ask the stewards to come. When the bread comes to you and the wine, just take the bread and take the wine. We're not going to wait for everybody this morning. So just take the bread, eat that.
Let's stand and continue in our song worship this morning. Oh, the mercy our God has shown to those who sit in death's shadow. Son on high, pierce the night, born was the cornerstone. Unto us a son is given, unto us a child is born. He who is mighty has done a great thing.
Yes, indeed. Crown him with many crowns. The King has come to earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The King, the long-awaited, promised Saviour. Father, thank you this morning we've been able to sing songs, Lord, that songs of fulfillment of all those promises, Lord, over those years that you've made, Lord. Father, the King has come to earth, our Saviour. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. If you'd uh, like to take your seats. First of all, a, a very warm welcome to any visitors with us this morning. We are really pleased that you're here with us, um, and we trust that you have uh, a good, blessed time with us. Um, just to start off this morning, Rachel is going to come and tell us something. I'm going to stand not by there because I look really short otherwise. Um, so I wanted to give you some information about the Younger Women's Bible Study. Um, before I do that, I wanted to tell you about this term. Um, it's been really encouraging. Um, we've had about six studies so far, and we've been going through the book of John um, using this guide. And um, we've been looking specific, at specific encounters with Jesus. And it's been really great being able to meet every other week, having that consistency, getting together, having fairly uninterrupted time when our children are behaving, um, to be able to study the Bible together. Um, so I think seeing the themes building from week on week, getting that deeper understanding of the, of the book of John, it's been great. Um, so I just want to let you know that we have a really lovely time. It's really encouraging to study together. It's really encouraging being able to pray for one another and know how each other are doing and to be able to deepen our friendships. Um, so we've decided that it would be nice to kind of switch between New Testament and Old Testament. So that means that next term we're going to be diving into the book of Judges. Uh, we're going to have six studies. Um, I think it's going to be interesting. I've never done a study in Judges as an adult. I think my memories are mainly um, looking at the book, uh, uh, the stories of Samson or Gideon or, and doing that from a child's perspective where I think we'll probably get a bit of a different emphasis when we're studying it as adults. Um, so we thought it would be a really interesting one to, to get into. Um, there's some hard stuff, but it's going to be very interesting. Um, so we're actually going to be kicking off on... Um, Friday the 12th of January, that's our first date, and then we'll be meeting pretty much every other Friday. All the dates are in the church weekly email, so check that out and put them in your diary if um, you're going to be involved. Um, we're meeting in the church hub, continuing to meet from 10.30 until about 12 o'clock. Um, if you would like to sign up, um, please could you talk to me or to Kate Hacker, and Kate's details are also in the church email. Um, if you have any questions about it, also just come and chat to us and we'll be able to let you know. But please come along if you are around on a Friday morning, if you are under 50 please, and a woman, please come and join us. Um, we'd love you to sign up before Christmas because we need to order our new books. We'll be using the same kind of study guide that we've been doing last time. Um, yeah, so that just gives us time to get enough in. Um, and then on the other side of things, part of what has made our studies so good has been the fact that we've been able to have a small crash. So quite a few of us have got little ones and the fact that they've been so well cared for has been a real blessing because we've been able to study the Bible without having little people needing things. Um, so a big thank you to Carol and also to Lizzie and her children and to the others who have helped us over the last term. It really has been a blessing. Um, if you are available on a Friday, some Fridays, any number of Fridays next term and would be interested in giving a couple of hours, please again, could you come and talk to either me or Kate because it's, it's been just such a blessing to us to be able to study together. Um, and my last shout out is that we have our final study on Friday the 15th of December. Um, Carol is around to help us out, but we find it really helpful if we do have two adults. So if somebody is free on that Friday, the 15th of December, could you come and let me know? Because we could just do with one more helper and that would be great. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Excellent. So um, a few, few announcements this week. So. Just as last week, there's a few more books at the back to collect. So if you didn't manage to check the uh, ad, the Advent devotional, um, 
There's one this uh, year, which is on Psalms. And there's also a red book there. I can't remember the name. But if you've got somebody in mind, friend, you could give that to, to just would give them some more information about the real meaning of Christmas. So those are on the table at the back. Um, home groups. Um, so basically, the, the upshot of this is over the next uh, three uh, weeks, really, that's uh, the, your home group leader will keep you informed of whether you're meeting um, yeah, so just uh, look out for messages from them to uh, keep you abreast of that. Uh, very important announcement, next Sunday is Messy Church. So perhaps what we'll do now, Isaac is, or whoever's on the projector, take two, we'll have the advertisements, that the flyers that are going out. There we go. So Messy Church, um, 10.30 to 12, that is next Sunday. And then we've got the carol service, and then we've got our Christmas uh, services there. So basically those are the... Those are the flyers, which leads me on to my next point. So at the back of the hall, we've got some Christmas cards, which are already, most of them are already pre-stuffed with those flyers, okay? They're all in packs um, with maps. So like other years, what we're asking you to do is please, 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 at the end, take some cards and, and deliver them. And ideally... Can you deliver them in the early part of the week? Because obviously the, the information is in there for, for Messy Church, which is on next Sunday. Now, there are a few cards. We've managed to pretty much get all of them signed, but there are a few that few packs that do need the cards to be signed, and those are marked with a red asterisk, so there'll be no confusion, okay? So if they're not with a red asterisk, you're good to take them and just deliver them according to the map. So all be self-explanatory, so... There we are on that one. Um, and also just to say again, thank you to all those who, who helped with the sign-in and also helped with the, the, the bag packing as well. So those gifts are going to be going out, those bags, to uh, those in need in the community as well. Um, also, just what we, actually now coming on to, I think those are all the, uh, all the announcements. Um, just coming on now to our, our prayer this morning. Um, what we're going to do, we're going we're gonna to pray for the wreath making evening which is which is this Tuesday um, again that's uh, that's been a been a sellout so yeah um, and there's lots of folks there who I believe do do come year on year so we'll, we'll pray again for for gospel opportunities um, for that we're also going to pray um, for those you know families who, who get the get the bags the gift bags again that that'll be a real blessing to them we want to pray for the cards that are going out that um, that people will come along to our, our Christmas events, so we want to we want to be praying for for all those uh, things this morning, and also for for Matt as he comes to bring God's word to us this morning. So would you would you join me in prayer, uh, dear Father? We do uh, pray for our Christmas events, Lord. We we pray for the wreath making event this Tuesday, Lord. We ask, Lord, that it would go as planned. And that, Lord, that for those who go along, many of whom have been before, that relationships will continue to grow and opportunities to share the good news of the gospel will arise. Lord, we ask that those who come along to make a wreath will also make it along to another one of our Christmas events. And Lord, we also pray for those gift bags that are going out to those in need in our community. We ask that you would meet their greatest need, Lord, and that they would know the gift of a saviour. Lord, we pray for the Christmas cards and invitations that go out this week to the houses in this area. Lord, we pray that many would accept the invite and come along to Messy Church or the carol service. And Lord, as the, as the lights start to adorn their homes, Lord, we pray this year, may they see the light of the gospel. And Father, we do pray um, for your help, Lord, with all the arrangements, Lord, with the Messy Church arrangements and preparations. Lord, we thank you for all those who are involved in putting this on. We ask for your blessing on this event. That, Father, we ask that young and old would hear something of the true message of Christmas. And, Father, we do pray for Matt, Lord, as he comes to bring your word, Lord. We ask, Father, would you, Lord, would you strengthen him, Lord? Would you anoint him, Lord? Father, would you help him, Lord, to proclaim your glorious truth this morning, Lord. And Father, we do, Lord, ask, Lord, that we would be 
Lord, hearers who hear your word, Lord, and Father, that your word would produce good things in our lives, Lord. So we do pray for the blessing of your preaching this morning. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And I think it's, uh, yep, Grace Kids this morning, so you guys can go out. You were, I think, with Matt and Nicola this morning, and Alison. Excellent. Hi there, everyone. Am I on? Yeah. Um, if you have a Bible, please turn to Matthew chapter 1. And while you're doing that, let me, um, let me talk to you a little bit more about Advent. Um, I realize some of us, maybe many of us, have already been opening Advent calendars in our homes. But as Pete said earlier on, today is officially the first day of Advent. I'm not sure I fully understood this until this year, and I realise that means I've got through quite a lot of life not really understanding when Advent starts. But apparently it's, it's the fourth Sunday before Christmas. It is confusing because sometimes it's in November, but because of the lay of the land this December, today is the first day of Advent. So I don't know if that means if you've been opening your calendar, maybe you've been doing something you shouldn't have been doing. I don't know. There's no judgment here. There is no biblical mandate, of course, as well, for us to observe Advent. But many Christians down the ages and around the world have found it to be a spiritually helpful and enjoyable season. Each of us maybe have our own variety of uh, December traditions, Advent traditions that we do ourselves or with family or with friends, all while we're waiting patiently and expectantly for the coming of Christmas. Our traditions as well, I think, often tend to build up and accumulate over the years, don't they? Uh, I think perhaps the older we get, the, the, you might find you've got more and more of these things that you like to do or things that other people impose on you at this time of year to do, from candles and lights and treats and wreaths to carols and special books and movies and outings and parties, all of these traditions... All of them can be good things, but what, what's f been freshly brought home to me this year, and maybe it has been to you as well, is that in reality, in every year, there will always be people amongst our church family for whom Christ Christmas is going to be especially difficult. At different times and in different years, one, of, one or more of us might find ourselves walking through especially difficult seasons. And for some of us, perhaps... For many of us, this year is going to be difficult. Some of us may not feel we want to celebrate Advent and Christmas in, in all of the same ways that we would have done in previous years, following all of the old traditions we used to do. Yet what's also been freshly brought home to me this year is that while, of course, traditions can have their place and play their part, they're not themselves the true essence of Advent or of Christmas. Removing some of them, altering many of them, doesn't change the real heart of this season. And in fact, sometimes things happen that give us an even keener focus on the real reason for this season. Because what Advent is really, really all about, as I hope we know, it's all about waiting and longing for Jesus it's all about looking to him, beholding him, and adoring him. It's all about Jesus. It's always been about him. About him and the miracle of his coming to us and the promise that he's coming back to us. That, of course, is what we intend to be doing as a church together all throughout December, particularly on our Sundays together. We want to see more of Jesus each time we gather. We want to adore him. Whatever our present circumstances, we 
long to behold him more clearly and treasure him more dearly this Christmas. And it's Jesus that we want to behold again this morning, isn't it? We just sang it and we sang it loud and we sang it with all of our hearts. We long to see him and adore him, to look to Jesus today in the midst of all the blessings and the hardships of this present broken world that we live in. God with us, then, is the title that I've given to this morning's sermon. God with us. And here in the passage we're going to focus on, in the midst of a very familiar story, here are events that have the power to freshly captivate our hearts with comfort and grace and glory. Here is the beginning of Matthew's account of how the king of all creation came down into the world that he had created. Matthew chapter 1, reading from verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, I'm keen, as I'm sure you will be, to get us as quickly as possible to Jesus himself this morning. And especially to the two names that are used here to refer to him. But first of all, Matthew does some important scene setting. And it all begins with a betrothal between a young woman named Mary and a man called Joseph. I know these things are familiar. But like most things in life, there are great bumps in the road, even here at the outset. Uh, So what is a betrothal? We might compare it to some extent with being engaged today. There are similarities to modern day engagement, but at the same time, betrothal was a much more serious and significant and binding thing. It was a solemn pledge to marry. It was a legally binding agreement between two people and their families. So much so that though the couple weren't yet married or living together, they would already be referred to as husband and wife. Matthew does that here in verse 19 when he refers to her husband, Joseph. Even though they're not not yet married, they're not living together, sleeping together, but, but already her husband, Joseph. This is how tight a thing betrothal is, how significant it was in that day. And the only way to call off a betrothal was to get a divorce. And so here are Mary and Joseph, not yet married, but very much betrothed, very soon to be married together. And then Joseph finds out that Mary's pregnant. In fact, by this point, she's probably three to four months pregnant. She's been away uh, with her cousin Elizabeth, and now she returns. Just put yourself for a moment in Joseph's shoes here. Of course, he's going to assume that Mary has been with another man and has been unfaithful to him. And, And we're told that being a just man who wants a godly marriage. He doesn't think it's right to go through with the wedding. But being a compassionate man, he also doesn't want to shame Mary publicly either. And so he decides to divorce her quietly, to try as best he can to protect her reputation. But it's not an easy decision. And even as he's wrestling with this great decision in his life, an angel appears to him in a dream and reveals to him what is really going on here. Now, we'll get to what's really happening in just a moment. But 
But the real problem for us this morning is we know this story so well, don't we? Everyone almost knows this story. Schools, in schools today, still the nativity story is played out and so many people know, at least in part, this story. We know this story so well. that We know this, the, the angel's explanation of a virgin birth, of a virgin conception. It might not surprise us or shock us in the way that it should. It's just part of the Christmas story, isn't it? Of course there's a virgin birth in there. But think how it would have stunned Joseph. How it would have arrested him where he stood and shocked him at what, was, what he was hearing and what was now taking place. Nothing like this had ever happened before or since. The angel's words are brand new information for him. Verse 20, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, from God. To put it simply, the child now growing in Mary's womb is no ordinary child. But what exactly, what exactly does that mean? What would Joseph see five or six months later as he sort of craned his neck over and looked into that manger? Are we... Are we now to expect kind of a baby with two heads or uh, a very angelic face and a, and a halo like you see in some of the paintings over, over the baby's head. No, it's nothing like that. Nothing that would be visible like that at all. This isn't about his external appearance. It's about his parentage. Quite simply, every other child ever born has had a human mother and a human father. But this child has God himself as his father. Hence why Mary can be pregnant and yet still a virgin. Behold, the virgin is with child. This is unprecedented and incredible. A miracle. And yet, then Matthew reminds his readers, long before this came to pass, God promised that one day this very thing would happen. Verse 23 all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. It's always nice, isn't it, I think, to be forewarned of big surprises. If you're anything like me, being thrown a surprise party wouldn't be your idea of a fun evening. I, for one, would much rather know if something big like that was coming and in the case of a surprise party, I would like to know so that I could try and get out of it. Here, though, there is a clear forewarning of this incredible event that's coming, but these words, this promise, is written 700 years before Mary's betrothal to Joseph. This is 700 years of waiting for something incredible. Sometimes, especially for the children amongst us, and also for the adults, one month, December, can seem like a long time to wait for Christmas. Uh, but I, I got my calculator out yesterday and I worked out this is more than 10,000 months worth of waiting and longing and hoping of both men and angels craning their necks and looking in eager expectation to see what the outcome of this promise would be. But now, Matthew says, at long last... The wait is finally over. This child, miraculously conceived in Mary's womb, is going to be the fulfillment of that mind-boggling promise. It's just like in Narnia. I know that is a story. This is history. That's a story. But just as the curse of winter finally begins to lift when Aslan arrives in Narnia, so with this new child growing inside Mary... The first Christmas is finally arriving after many centuries of waiting. And this child, this baby right now, this fetus, comes not with one name but two names here in this passage. Two names that tell us so much about him. One name telling us who he is, the other telling us what he has come to do. And it's those two names that I would like us, I'd love us to spend the rest of our time together this morning exploring. The first name, Emmanuel, 
is, is so deep, I want to spread it over two points. So I have two headings for this one. And then the second name, Jesus, is going to be the focus of our third and final heading. We're going to see that this child then is, first of all, God. Secondly, God with us. And thirdly, God with us to save us. And may the Lord help us now to freshly behold and adore our Savior as we consider his names together. First of all then, he is quite simply God. They shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. I struggled this week to know where to begin with this, I'll be honest. What we have to remember here is that this is very much a human being growing inside Mary. And yet at one and the same time, this is also the living God. And honestly, I find myself, and I found myself at my keyboard, and I find myself now again, uh, w- without words really, to begin to be able to describe this. When you really consider it, God with us. God in a womb. God in a manger. God in human flesh. How is it that he who made us became like us? That he who is our God became our fellow man? How is it that he who feeds all living things could become hungry and thirsty for his mother's milk? How is it that he who holds all created things together could lay tired and asleep in a manger? Fully God and fully man. I did actually, what I think is always a good thing to do, a wise thing to do when you're struggling for words to describe something uh, profound and biblical, I I got out our statement of faith. Here's what our church's statement of faith says. In this union, two whole, perfect and distinct natures were inseparably joined together in the one person of the divine Son, without confusion, mixture or change. Thus, our Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son incarnate, is fully God and fully man. Or as Tim Chester puts it in slightly more everyday language, it's as if the splendor of God has been squeezed into a human body. Imagine trying to pack all your possessions into a suitcase, squashing it, pushing it, sitting on it, trying to cram them all in. That is what God did at the incarnation. He took the fullness of the deity and squeezed it into bodily form and nothing was left out. Colossians 2 verse 9, in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. The incarnation is without a shadow of a doubt the most extraordinary miracle in the whole Bible. The most profound mystery in the whole universe. No wonder there are so many hymns written about this. So many hymns we love to sing at this time of year. You really have to sing about something like this, don't you? Charles Wesley wrote, he sung... Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord, late in time, behold him come, offspring of the virgin's womb, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel, God with us. So what does this mean for us? That this tiny infant is God himself. It means, first of all, that God has definitively revealed himself to us. It means that we do not live in a silent universe. That the God who made us speaks to us. In the past, Hebrews 1 tells us that God spoke to us uh, in many at many times and in many ways, but now he has spoken to us most definitively, most clearly and completely in his Son. The idea of God with us is not just some abstract theological idea, some impersonal thing. Emmanuel is personal. He's got hands and feet and a face to look at. This is God with skin on. 
God with us is a person. Now the Jewish people of, Paul, of, um, of Matthew's day had such an exalted conception of God that they knew God had told them, don't make an image of me. They knew not to make an image of God. And that was something which apparently so amazed their, uh, their, their Roman conquerors, the, the Roman people around them, that they dubbed the Jewish people atheists, people without gods because they didn't have any images of their gods. But against all of that background, here now is Matthew the Jew claiming not just that God himself has given us a perfect image of himself, but that that image is a living, breathing person. It's an amazing claim right here at the outset of Matthew's gospel. It is so ultimate that we don't need to look for God in any other place or object or religion. In fact, we categorically will not find a true image of him anywhere else. Only here, God reveals himself completely now in Jesus. That means, second of all, that, God, that the God who has revealed himself is exactly like Jesus. Uh, I, we really want to unpack this some more in our carol service in a couple of weeks' time because this is something so important for our neighbours and our friends and our family members to grasp that God looks just like Jesus. That's what we want to try and explain in very simple terms in a couple of weeks. But it's so important for us to grasp this as well. We can, we can lose sight of this so quickly as Christians. That because Jesus is fully God, therefore we can be sure that God's character is exactly like Jesus' character. We can be sure of that. That God is exactly the kind of God who pours himself out in love towards his creatures because that is what he has done in the person of his son, Jesus. As human beings, we can so often have so many misconceptions about what God is like. So often when people think about God, they think of a distant, lonely being defined most of all by just cold, hard power and logic. Glenn Scrivener writes, a lot of people's theology of God is exposed at Christmas. They basically have this idea of God that's defined by bigness. And then whatever is going on in the manger, we almost don't want to take it too seriously. Yes, yes, but he's still really big. He's just on holiday from his deity at this point. Whereas Philippians 2 is saying, no, he's expressing his deity there. This is what deity looks like. Which is why Luther said, no other God have I but thee. Born in a manger, died on a tree. So whatever God you're thinking about that wouldn't stoop to the cross and the cradle... You're not thinking about the true God. This is what God looks like. To put it another way, there is nothing unchristlike about God's character. God the Father is just like his Son. Which each time we return to think about it should bring us the most incredible reassurance and comfort. Listen to Isaac Watts in another hymn. Till God in human flesh I see my thoughts no comfort find. The holy, just, and sacred three are terrors to my mind. But if Emmanuel's face appear, my hope, my joy begins. His name forbids my slavish fear. His grace removes my sins. Behold, he is Emmanuel, God with us. The comfort of Christmas begins right here with that fact, that truth. But it isn't where it finishes. It's not all that we've got here this morning. This same name, Emmanuel, that tells us this is God, also tells us, secondly, this morning, that he is God, truly and permanently with us. God with us, second of all then, this morning. God with us, now and always. Aren't you grateful that Matthew's gospel doesn't just start and end with the birth of Jesus? That God didn't just pop down for five minutes or even just for five months growing in a womb, only to be born and return to heaven. No, instead, this child, this man lived his entire life with us. 
and shared the fullness of human experience with us. Uh, That means he was crying and cooing and waking his parents, no doubt even on that very first night. So apologies to whoever wrote Silent Night, but that bit's not right. He was a real baby. He shared in our everyday human limitations. He had to grow up just like us, slowly and gradually. He had to learn to walk and to learn his first words just like us. Later on, he had to go through all that's involved in going from being a boy to a man. And all through his life, he slept like us and ate like us. He laughed like us and wept like us. He worked like us and took breaks like us. And none of these things as well did he do alone. He did them in community. He did them with people just like us. Friends and families, strangers and visitors. He truly came to be God with us in every possible way. Sharing in our humanity to the fullest possible extent. But we might, of course, look on, understandably, at the incarnation and say, well, it's wonderful that that God came down, that Christ came down to be with people for 33 years on, on this earth. But still, that was a long time ago, wasn't it? Way before my time. So what real difference does that make, even if it was a whole life? What, does it, what difference does it make to us today? What difference does it make to my life and my trials today? Well, I wonder, have you ever noticed how Matthew's gospel not only starts but also finishes with the promise of God with us in Christ? It starts with God with us. That's where we are this morning in Matthew 1. But it ends with, surely I will be with you always to the end of the age. What that means, what that tells us, is that his name, Emmanuel, wasn't just a temporary name. It wasn't just a name meant to last for 33 years or so. It is, in fact, an everlasting name for Christ that makes an everlasting promise to us. Here is the promise that having come at Christmas to be God with us, he will always be God with us. Today and tomorrow and for all of eternity, he has promised to never leave us nor forsake us, but always be God with us. Even more than that, since Pentecost, we know the spirit of Christ dwells in us. So Emmanuel, God with us, dwells in us in the person of his spirit. So that David's words in Psalm 139 are even more true for us now than they were for him. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? Now, today, for us as Christians, Christ, Emmanuel, is always with us. Present with us by his spirit. Well, let's just, I'd love us to ponder that then just for a moment here. We all know the blessing of having other people in our lives, don't we? Especially when we're walking through difficulties. God's intention for his people, for his church, is that no one should live the Christian life alone, but that we should all have other believers, loving brothers and sisters, living life alongside us. We live life best together in the high points and the lows. And we've experienced that recently, haven't we? Even in the midst of great heartache, the blessing of walking through grief and through the valley of the shadow of death together not alone. And yet still there are times in everyone's day, big moments in everybody's lives when no one else is able to be with us. Times when we're physically all alone, unable to be with others. There are some trials too in which perhaps we, we, we feel no one else can fully understand and walk alongside us, even when they're sat just next to us or across the room from us. There are some valleys that no one else can completely enter into with us. No one, that is, but Jesus. For there is nowhere that he cannot go to be with us. Nowhere he is not still present with us. Nowhere he ceases to be Emmanuel, God with us. That's the promise that dawned on this first Christmas. That now he's forever more present with us in life and in death and in everything else between. He is God with us when we feel lonely or sick or guilt-ridden 
or full of despair or overcome with fear. He is God with us when redundancy looms, when sickness strikes, when children rebel, when money runs out or when loved ones are taken from us. He is God with us when our whole life appears to be crumbling and the entire world seems to fall away around us. He is God with us in all these things and all other things besides. And in all these things, he sympathizes with us more completely than we can possibly imagine. We've seen this in a way already in the fact that he took on flesh and blood and bone for us. That he became fragile like us. But more than that, we see it in the God-ordained circumstances of his birth and his life and his death. That he was born not in a palace, uh, but in a stable or something like that. That he wasn't laid in an ornate cot, but a feeding trough for the animals. That soon he and his family had to flee from a child-murdering dictator. That he would go on to know what it was to be in poverty. What it was to weep at the tomb of a friend. What it was to be slandered by enemies and betrayed by a friend. What it was to be lonely and weighed down in Gethsemane. And what it was to be all alone at Calvary. Spurgeon once said, one man he was, and yet all lives seemed to be condensed in his. It wasn't a fairy tale world that Jesus was born into, but the real world. This dark and difficult world, the same world that we find ourselves living in today. And all of these events tell us that God came to be with us, not just in our humanity, incredible in itself, but in our brokenness. God with us in our danger and our suffering. That's what it means that he came as Emmanuel. God with us, not just to witness our pain, but to firsthand experience it and share it and eventually to die for it. So let me ask you, if I may, where do you find yourself this morning? What pain are you suffering? What sorrows are weighing on your heart? And what situations in life do you find yourself most alone or afraid, or vulnerable. Take comfort in the promises of God this Christmas. That Christ has been there where you are, and that Christ is with you, and that Christ is full of sympathy. He knows firsthand what you're feeling. It says in Hebrews 4 verse 15, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. He knows what every pain is like. He knows from his own experience our deepest, darkest sorrows, physically, mentally, emotionally. He knows as a human being how they feel. And so his heart is forevermore full of infinite and unending sympathy. A sympathy that is only matched by the endless storehouse of mercy and grace and kindness that he stands ever ready to show to us in our time of need. We can turn to him in our every need and cast our cares on him in every heartache and difficulty, knowing that not only is he God, but God with us. Fully God and fully man, and so fully able, mightily and tenderly, to sympathize with us in all our weaknesses and to help us. He was made exactly as we are and has been in every way tempted and tried like we are. Yet gloriously, Hebrews 4 goes on to say, he did not sin. And it's in that one vitally, that's the one vitally different aspect of his humanity. In that one vitally different aspect. That our ultimate hope of life and peace and forgiveness and comfort and And reconciliation is found. Here is why, thirdly and finally and briefly this morning, Christ is able so completely to be Emmanuel, God with us, yesterday, today and forever. Here is why, because he came to be God with us to save us. Verse 21, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. 
That, that name, Emmanuel, it was more like one of, Jesus, one of his titles. But his actual name, the name the angels tell Joseph to give to this child when he's born, is Jesus, which gets right to the heart of why he came. His name means the Lord saves. And here is why he had himself to come. Here's why he couldn't just send an angel or a messenger in his place. Nothing less than God himself, born into the world as a child. Nothing less than the Son of God, taking on our very own flesh. Coming to dwell with us and live for us and die for us. Nothing less than fully God and fully man, crucified on a cross for us, could possibly be sufficient to save us from our sins. If he hadn't been Emmanuel, God with us, he couldn't have been Jesus, the saviour of sinners. Only one who was fully God and fully man could come and die in our place. And so not thinking twice about it, the Son of God took on flesh for us. He became God with us in a manger and then just 30 something years later, that same flesh that had been cradled in his mother and father's arms, that same flesh was pierced and broken for us as he hung on a cross at Calvary. He was born into our world at Christmas to be God with us, to save us at Easter. And still today he is God with us able and eager to save all who might decide, even today, for the very first time, to repent and believe in him. And if you've never done that before, won't you run to him and turn to him for refuge and rescue today? He stands with outstretched arms again this morning and invites you to come. But to every Christian, here is what he says to us so clearly, finally, through our passage this morning. I am forevermore your Emmanuel. God with you and you with me forever. This morning, our Savior, fully God and fully man, sits at the right hand of the Father on high, still bearing the nail marks in his hands and feet. Human hands and human feet that we will one day touch and see but which even now declares to us, see, I have borne your own sins once and for all in my body on that tree. Though your sins were like scarlet, I have washed them white as snow. They say to us, nothing can separate you from my love. That, of course, is really the, the, the overarching message of the whole Bible. But as we've just seen, it's also right there in seed form in the very first chapter of Matthew in a prophetic promise and an angelic announcement given to a very normal kind of troubled fiancé called Joseph. At the news of Mary's pregnancy, remember, first of all, Joseph's whole world began to fall apart. But then he heard the revelation of this child's names, of where he'd come from and what he would be for them. Then Joseph's perspective was transformed. His fear was transformed into faith. Despair into delight, heartache into hope. And he was enabled to go on trusting in the Lord, to go on following him, even rejoicing in the good news of what God in his grace was doing in the coming of Jesus. And so too, those two names and the person behind them can totally transform our experience of Christmas this year. They can give us, he can give us great hope and comfort, and joy. No matter where we find ourselves, we can be assured this Christmas the Lord himself is with us. He is not a distant figure looking on from afar. He is Jesus Emmanuel, God with us, with a heart full of love and compassion for us. So to come back around, it really doesn't matter what we might choose to do in our traditions to celebrate Christmas this year. All that matters is that we do all we can to find our rest in him, to cast our cares on him, to behold him, and thank him, love him, serve him and adore him. Jesus, our Savior, God with us, Emmanuel. Let's pray. 
Father in heaven, we acknowledge together that our, the great joy and hope of Christmas is Christ himself. That Jesus is not just the icing on the cake or some added extra, but the whole reason that we celebrate at this time of year and all throughout the year. And so, Lord, we pray, please satisfy our souls in your Son again this Christmas. Help us to rest in him and glorify his name. Exalt him in us. Satisfy our souls in him, we pray. Not even just in his salvation, but in Emmanuel himself, God with us. And help each one of us to receive him as the greatest gift of Christmas and gladly declare that we are made for him and will be with him forever. In his precious name we pray together. Amen. Please stand.
Father, thank you this morning for this glorious truth that we've been reminded of this morning. God with us. What a miraculous thing that is. What an amazing thing that is. And what a transformation that has made in our lives. Christ in us. The hope of glory. Lord, thank you. Thank you as we begin this Christmas season. Lord, may the hope of glory rest in our minds and in our hearts throughout this season. And throughout all our celebrations, may we be conscious freshly, day by day, of Jesus with us, God incarnate. God with us, saving us, bringing peace to our hearts. May you be glorified in our lives over this Christmas period. In Jesus' name. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Have a wonderful, grace-filled afternoon.